Thank you for the introduction. I'm Ryo Fujiwara, from, originally from Japan. Currently, I'm a guest professor in Germany. Today, I'm, I'll be talking about a new model mice, which is a Krigner Najar syndrome model mice. And we try to rescue them with zinc protopore film. And we are working on this project to understand the potential benefits of hyperbilinemia. So let me introduce some basics of this enzyme, UDP glucuronosyl transferase, UGT. Uh, UGTs are also known as a phase two drug metabolizing enzymes. They catalyze glucuronidation of substrates. They are membrane bound enzymes and express in a endoplasmic reticular membrane and uh, most of the proteins are located in the luminal side of the membrane. They form uh, dimers or sometimes tetramers and they recognize two molecules. One is substrate and one is host substrate, UDP glucuronic acid. And UGTs uh, transfer this glucuronic acid to the substrate so they produce glucuronide. This is an important process of detoxification. So it's important reaction. So in humans, there are two main families, UGT1 and UGT2. And UGT1 genes are uh, here. So they have many exon ones and exon two to five. And in humans, there are nine functional UGT1A subfamilies, UGT1A1 to UGT1A10. And exon one is very unique to each UGT1 ice form. And one of the, the exon one is selected and then they splice to common exon two to five. So as you can see here, exon one is very unique and spe specific to each ice form and exon two to five are identical. And recently uh, the research group in Canada found that ex there are two actually uh, different exon fives, exon 5A and 5B. So now you can see here there are nearly 20 UGT1A subfamilies, including the variant one and variant two. So this is a uh, exon sharing system. But on the other hand, UGT2 families, there are individual genes for each genes. And for example, UGT2B7, this is uh, important for the, the metabolism of morphines. But today, I'll be more focusing on ugt one one because ugt one one is a, a very important isome for the bilirubin glucuronidation. So including ugt one one and also other isomes are expressed everywhere in the body, but mostly in the liver because we know that liver is a very important tissue for the metabolism, not only for the bilirubin or drugs, but any kinds of metabolism usually happen in the liver. But UGTs are also expressed in the other tissues such as small intestine or stomach and colon and kidney and also in the brain. Okay, so today uh, I'll be talking about bilirubin a lot, I guess. So bilirubin is uh, the end product of heme catabolism. And as you know, heme is uh, the molecule that's uh, contained in uh, uh, red blood cells. And this is a degradation of heme to bilirubin. So bilirubin is a neurotoxic compound, so it's really bad to a human, especially brains. But it's okay because we have this isome UGT-Y1, and it can metabolize bilirubin to a glucuronide. So this is one of the systems to detoxify bilirubin. But um, somehow human babies, human neonates, uh, physiologically develop mild jaundice. This is like a, a elevated serum bilirubin levels. As you can see here, right after the bone, uh, in the human babies, serum bilirubin, bilirubin levels go up and it lasts for a few weeks. And it is okay because this is kind of a natural process of being human babies and the uh, bilirubin levels goes down after a few weeks. So it's fine, 
But sometimes, if you have super high bilirubins, and bilirubin can go inside of the brain, and that develops carnictrus, this is a very severe case of brain damage. And you can't ignore this carnictrus because even though it's rare, the number of carnictrus cases is actually increasing recently. So this is a very, very important issue for our uh, research area. The interesting read, um, this, um, we say neonatal jaundice, is very specific to humans. It doesn't happen in mice or rats or other uh, animals. So that's why that we don't know much about jaundice at all. We don't know anything, not anything, but uh, we don't know basics of how we develop jaundice or why we have this jaundice during the, the pre-neonatal uh, period. And the reason, the main reason that we don't know any of those things is that, that we don't have good animal models that display hyperbilirubinemia like human babies. As I said, that the mice or rats, they don't have jaundice even during the, the neonatal period, but only human babies develop higher and severe hyperbilirubinemia. Bilirubin levels can go up to five to 20 milligrams per deciliter, and this is very high. And it doesn't happen in the mice. Their bilirubin is super low. And, uh, there are many you know, differences between humans and mice, but we focused on the genes of UGTY1. This is known as like a, there is a big specific species difference in the function of UGTY1. So the function of UGTY1 is totally different between mice and humans. So one of the hypotheses was that if we created humanized UGT1 mice that have uh, human UGT1 genes instead of mouse UGT1 genes, they might develop jaundice, the same as in human babies. So we had in California, we had UGT1 neuromice back in 2008, and we also developed human UGT1 transgenic mice in 2008, uh, 2005. So we crossed them to develop humanized UGT1 mice. This is um, the serum bilirubin levels in the neonatal mice of the wild type mice and also humanized UGT1 mice. They look totally identical, but the gene is different. One is humanized. So as I said, in the wild type mice, their bilirubin is quite low, and this is an example of their serum. It's pure, you know, a, a clear. But the serum in the humanized UGT1 mice, uh, it, the color is bright yellow. This is the color of bilirubin. It has a yellow color. So that indicates that, that they have jaundice during the neonatal period. And if you, if you measure the serum bilirubin levels, actually, the bilirubin level is really high compared to the white type mice. So we wanted to know why that humanized UGT1 mice have higher bilirubin. We, isolated two tissues, liver and small intestine, to understand what's going on in bilirubin metabolism. And we learned that there's not enough UGTY1 in the liver, which is a very important tissue for the metabolism of bilirubin. So this is like a basic reason that humanized UGT1 mice develop jaundice because they can't metabolize bilirubin in the liver, so they develop increased bilirubin. But at the same time, we also found some interesting fact in the small intestine. They have relatively higher expression of UGT1 in small intestine, like here. And if you look at carefully, you find something very interesting. Um, you, uh, you see here, the serum bilirubin level is actually a little bit lower at the beginning. And at that time, you see relatively higher expression of UGT1 in small intestine. And somehow, the mice have increased bilirubin at two weeks after birth, and at the moment, uh, they don't have enough expression of UGTY1 in small intestine. That's why they can't metabolize bilirubin in the small intestine. And at 21, in a, uh, three weeks after birth, they have decreased serum bilirubin levels in the blood, 
and at the time, there's an increased expression of UGT Y1 small intestine. So if you have higher uh, UGT Y1 expression in the small intestine, they can metabolize bilirubin. But if they don't have small intestine expression, they can't metabolize bilirubin, so bilirubin level goes up. So this is a very fast data that's showing that the small intestine is might be very important for bilirubin metabolism. The data that I showed was like an average serum bilirubin patterns, but these plots are individual uh, serum bilirubin levels in the each mice. As you can see here, in, in general, the bilirubin levels goes up, and uh, two weeks, you can see the peak, and after that, it goes down. But uh, some mice have really high bilirubin levels, and they develop chronic trust this is a very bad um, brain damage that coming from the accumulation of bilirubin in the brain. So as you can see here, if you reach some point, it's very dangerous. So the next question we had was uh, why there's a pattern of bilirubin levels. The bilirubin levels go up and then go down at two weeks after birth. And we knew that from the publications that breastfeeding is one of the risk factors of neonatal hyperbilinemia. And in humans, if you have uh, the breastfed infant and formula-fed infant, you can see that the bilirubin level is relatively higher in the breastfed infants compared to the formula-fed infants. And if you work on the mice, maybe you notice, know but uh, Basically, all of the mice are breastfed one because we don't feed formula feeding. But um, those formula are not formula. Uh, the breastfeeding happens for the first two weeks of the life. After two weeks, uh, those baby mice start eating the solid food. So they are separating from the, the breast milk. So we thought that maybe breastfeeding or breast milk is controlling this bilirubin patterns in the mice. So we know that the small intestine is very important for the bilirubin metabolism in these mice. And we know that uh, there's a tight connection or link between UGTYMI expression in the small intestine and bilirubin. And we wanted to know what it would be like a day before that they are born that they are not exposed to the breast milk. And this is the expression of UGT Y1 in the small intestine one day before they are born. So you can see here, the expression is actually high. But after they are born, the UGT Y1 expression is actually decreasing, and they develop jaundice. And when they uh, the food, then separate from the breast milk, the UGT Y1 expression comes back. So this data indicates that the breast milk somehow suppresses UGT Y1 expression in the small intestine, and that's controlling the serum bilirubin levels. So in humans, uh, the breast feeding is inducing serum bilirubin levels, and on the other hand, formula feeding decreases the, the serum bilirubin levels in human babies. So we wanted to test if the same things will happen in this humanized UGT1 mice. So we separated a couple of mice at day eight, and like here, this is me, like 10 years ago, but uh, we fed the mice that the human formula, and we did for seven days. And surprisingly, serum bilirubin levels went down so dramatically. So this model mice is acting so different, uh, samely as you can see in the humans. So again, like we wanted to know why formula feeding is so reducing serum bilirubin levels. And we know that UGTY1 is the only enzyme that can glucuronidate bilirubin. So we isolated liver and small intestine to understand what's going on in uh, those tissues. 
But the reverse, the, you can see that any of the difference between formula fed infant and the for, uh, breastfed infant, even though the liver is a very important tissue for the bilirubin glucuronidation. But again, in the small intestine, we saw a huge induction of UGDY1 in the formula fed infant. Like here, if the mice were a breastfed, the UGDY1 expression in the small intestine was kind of low. So this data um, say that, uh, again, the breastfeeding is reducing the bilirubin glucuronidating enzyme and that inducing serum bilirubin levels. On the other hand, formula feeding is inducing UGDY1 that can reduce serum bilirubin levels. So that's a very good like, uh, data to see, but um, we also had a very important question in our research because the data indicates that uh, breastfeeding is really bad. Breastfeeding is inducing serum bilirubin levels and that inducing the risk of uh, carnitas in human babies. So let me go back to this bilirubin catabolism and uh, the, the, uh, the detoxification of bilirubin. So bilirubin here, this is like a, again, end product of hem catabolism and this bilirubin is neurotoxic and hydrophobic, so it's really bad for human, babe, uh, human, bo human bodies. But this compound, bilirubin, this is not toxic at all. This is also hydrophilic, so it's easy to excrete from the body. But uh, through the evolution, the mammals acquire this enzyme, bilirubin reductase, so we have the system to convert that this safe compound bilirubin to bilirubin. Um, this is common to all the mammals, not only humans. So we somehow uh, have a system to produce this toxic compound in the body. And also, the mammals, the other than humans, they don't develop hyperbilirubinemia, as I showed earlier. The mice or rats and other mammals, they don't have hyperbilirubinemia at all. Only humans have hyperbilirubinemia, like like you guys and me, you know, I have a serum bilirubin of 0.5 to sometimes one milligram per deciliter, but it's not toxic because it's not that high. But this only happens in humans. The mice, adult mice or adult rats, their bilirubin is quite uh, super low. Also, not only the, this adult hyperbilirubinemia, the human neonates has relatively higher serum bilirubin levels, and the funny fact was breastfeeding is also inducing hyperbilirubinemia. And this is like an example of serum bilirubin levels in the breastfed human babies and also formula fed human babies. As you can tell here that the breastfeeding is actually inducing serum bilirubin levels and that's inducing the risk of carnitas. And as I showed this slide earlier, but the cases of carnitas is recently increasing. And there are many, many uh, potential explanations that can explain this. But uh, one with a strong uh, hypothesis was that back in 1970 to 80, the main way of feeding was formula. But recently, we are encouraged to feed uh, breastfeed, breast milk. So maybe that's why we have more cases of carnitas. But it shouldn't be, because breastfeeding is one of the natural way of the feeding, and it's supposed to be good to human bodies. And we look up many publications, and we found many facts. It's very interesting. Um, the publications say that the breast uh, bilirubin, it's a very strong antioxidant. It is a neurotoxic, but at the same time, bilirubin is also a potent antioxidant. And if you have, um, higher serum bilirubin and you have a good antioxidant capacities in the body. And in the neonates, if you have hyperbilirubinemia, uh, you see um, the risks of disease is actually lower. And not only in the neonates, but in adults, if you have hyperbilirubinemia, the risks of, for example, cancer or cardiovascular disease is actually lower compared to that, uh, the adults that have relatively lower serum bilirubin. So this data indicates that uh, maybe hyperbilirubinemia is good to hum human bodies. 
So the next, our project was to find out how those beneficial effect of bilirubin is coming from. So that this is, was a very good model to understand the impact of hyperbilirubinemia. This is a UGT1 knockout mice. They don't have ugt y one so that they can't metabolize bilirubin. So their bilirubin goes high, really high, and their skin is, tot or whole body is stained yellow. This is the color of bilirubin. So we can use this model to understand the impact of bilirubin in the body. But the thing is, uh, these are highly lethal, they die within uh, 10 days or 11 days of their life because increased bilirubin goes to the inside of the brain and that develop carnictus and all of the, the mice that develop carnictus can die. So our project was to rescue them with some chemical treatment so that we can create hyperbilirubinemia mice. So we tested two molecules. One is uh, here, beta nut flavon, and this is an inducer of cytochrome P450. Cytochrome P450, uh, they can oxidize the bilirubin, so this is a, it's not a major way of bilirubin uh, detoxification, but P450 can also uh, slightly uh, metabolize bilirubin through oxidation. So beta nafrebon induced P450s, and also this compound, zinc protoporphyrin, this is like an inhibitor of heme oxygenase 1. This is an important enzyme for the heme catabolism. So if you treat the mice with zinc protoporphyrin, you can inhibit the production of bilirubin. And also, if you treat the mice with beta nafrebon, maybe you can accelerate the bilirubin oxidation. So these are the survival curves of the, the knockout mice, and this is like a non-treated mice. So without treatment, they, all of them died within seven days. But when we treated the mice, the same knockout mice with beta naft flavon, the survival extended. So they lived relatively longer, but the surgery of the, the mice died and they didn't reach three weeks of the life. But when we treated the mice with zinc porphyrin, this is an inhibitor of hemoxygenase 1, all of the mice survived, and they reached three weeks, and they are still alive, and they are six months old or even longer. So it was good that we can save the knockout mice with zinc porphyrin treatment. So this is like an example of serum bilirubin levels in, uh, in the mice. As you can see here, the humanized UGT1 mice, they develop mild jaundice, and UGT1 knockout mice, they develop super high bilirubin, so it's really lethal. But once you treat the mice with beta flavon, it can induce oxidation of bilirubin, so bilirubin levels uh, go down a little bit. They survive a little bit longer compared to the, the non-treated knockout mice, but if you treat the mice with zinc protoporphyrin, they live longer and they have relatively uh, lower serum bilirubin levels. So this is like a, a, the knockout mice that received zinc protoporphyrin treatment. So even though we stopped the chemical treatment at two weeks of the life, they still uh, they can survive for longer period of the life. So now we have adult UGT1 knockout mice, and we wanted to test if they, ha they are capable of pregnancy. So we had a male mice and female mice, and we crossed them to see if they are capable of pregnancy. And they were. For example, um, this, uh, the black lines is uh, the survival of UGT1 knockout mice, and we usually keep this line with heterozygous mice. So the both parents, Male and female are heterozygous, and uh, the newborns are completely knockout in a chance. But the new mice that are born, the same knockout mice, but they are born from the homozygous UGT1 knockout mice, uh, they died faster. They didn't reach seven days. They, most of them died within three to five days. 
and their bilirubin was super high even at the day two. For example, the NOCAD mice, the, their genetic background is the same, but uh, the difference is that their parents is heterozygous, almost like a wild-time mice, or their parents are the, the same NOCAD mice. So these mice that are born from heterozygous mice, uh, the pregnancy, during the pregnancy, mothers can uh, glucuronidate bilirubin. So right after the babies are born, bilirubin level is quite low. But this, uh, the new UGT1 knockout mice that are born from homozygous knockout mice, uh, the pregnant mother, they can't metabolize bilirubin. So right after the born, the bilirubin level is already super high. So at day second, the bilirubin is it's increasing and it's twice higher than the, the one that are born from heterozygous mice. So that's the reason that they die faster. But we tested if they uh, can survive with zinc porphyrin treatment, then yes, uh, it worked. If you treat a mice with zinc porphyrin, and they uh, inhibit the production of bilirubin and so bilirubin doesn't go that high. So anyway, now we have four different mouse lines. One is white type mice, and one is heterozygous mice, and their bilirubin is quite low. And one is a UGT1 knockout mice that we used to have, and they're born from uh, heterozygous mice, so their bilirubin is high, but not that super high. And the same genetic background, UGT1 knockout mice, uh, this is born from uh, knockout mice, so we call them knockout, knockout mice. So their bilirubin is super, super high. So we have four different mouse lines, then uh, we can understand how or what the bilirubin is doing in the body. So we focus on the livers, we isolate the livers, and we run microarrays to understand what is going on in the liver. This is uh, the top uh, 10 genes that are are downregulated or upregulated in uh, the no card mice. Uh, for example, uh, this, the top half is uh, upregulated genes in the no card mice, and the bottom half is uh, the 10 genes that are downregulated in the no card mice. And as you can see here, the, somehow the impact of hyperbilirubinemia is more significant in the downregulation of genes you can see that there are more than 10-fold downregulation of the genes here. But it's not that quite um, effective in, to the upregulation of the genes. Uh, only one gene shows 10-fold induction, but most of the genes are only affected for couple-fold induction. And so these are the wild type, and compared to that, heterozygous and knockout and knockout and knockout mice, they have relatively higher uh, uh, difference in the gene expression, and the impact was more significant in the downregulation. And this is an example, acting alpha-1. Um, the expression was very similar between white type and heterozygous mice, but if you have hyperbilirubinemia, the downregulation happened in the knockout mice or knockout, knockout mice. Not only uh, the microarray analysis, we also ran the uh, real-time PCR, and again, the, this gene acting alpha one expression is downregulated by hyperbilirubinemia. If you have a uh, higher bilirubin, the expression in the liver goes down significantly. So bilirubin is not only inducing neurotoxicity, but also controlling gene expression in the liver. And we uh, also treated uh, culturing cells uh, with bilirubin. For example, this is like a human uh, carcinoma cells, hep G2 cells, and we treated the cells with bilirubin, and we can see the similar reduction of actin alpha-1 gene in the cells, like here, it's uh, dose dependent. And we also treated the same cell lines with uh, vitamin E. This is a uh, uh, it's not uh, neurotoxic compounds, but uh, this is like a strong antioxidant. So if you treat a, 
uh, the cells with vitamin E, you can see the same reduction of actin alpha 1 expression. So the capacity of the bilirubin that induces this downregulation is not, it's not the neurotoxicity, but uh, the, its antioxidant capacities. So uh, we observed that uh, uh, many, many, many genes that are affected by the hyperbilirubinemia. So for example, there we observed more than 200 genes that are affected by hyperbilirubinemia. So to understand what kind of genes are actually affected, so we categorized the genes from the data of microarrays and uh, we mapped the genes here. So in uh, heterozygous mice, uh, not that many genes are different from the white-time mice, but if you have uh, hyperbilirubinemia in the knockout or knockout on a mice in the liver, many, many genes are actually affected, and mostly those genes are categorized in the transport or metabolic-associated genes. And as I said uh, a little bit earlier, the impact was more significant to downregulation of the genes. For example, um, many you know, genes categorized to this uh, group are downregulated in uh, hyperbilirubinemia mice. And I don't think I can explain well about the difference between the white type and white type mice and uh, UGT1 heterozygous mice uh, because their behavior is not that different, but somehow the microarray data indicates that these genes are different. But even still, that uh, if you have super high bilirubin in the blood, uh, some unique groups that are categorized in a nucleotide or transport or some immunoresponse, those related associated genes are more uh, affected by hyperbilirubinemia. So bilirubin is not only just inducing neurotoxicity in the brain, but it's doing something in the, in the liver, and we assume that the same things will happen in the other tissues too. So this is a conclusion of today's talk that first we uh, showed for the first time that uh, not only the hepatic UGT, but the uh, intestinal UGT Y1 is also important for the bilirubin metabolism, especially during the neonatal period. And uh, we show that uh, lethality of UGT1 knockout mice can be rescued by zinc protoporphyrin. And at the end, we learned that the bilirubin's antioxidative properties can regulate zinc special in the liver. And that maybe uh, provide us a wide variety of benefits. So this is our picture that we are thinking of, that if you have hyperbilirubinemia uh, during the adult or during the this neonatal period, maybe uh, they acquire some better benefit and later life they have uh, less risk of uh, developing disease. So maybe it can lead to the longevity. So once again, that uh, uh, neurotoxicity of bilirubin is really bad, we know that. So you wanna avoid the carnivorous cases in the human babies. But at the same time, bilirubin can be benefit. So the next step that for our research is to understand the balance of the beneficial impact of bilirubin and the, the adverse reaction of bilirubin. So I'd like to thank the groups and people in the Tokyo here and also uh, the Bob Turkey and his group in the uh, University of California, San Diego, and also uh, many people in the uh, in German research group. So this is it, thank you for your attention.